Yo, I'm Nash Bandit, and today I'm here to talk about something that I have been dreaming of having for a long time. What is that, you may ask? I mean, the title of the video gives it away, but you know what I mean. Yes, today I'm talking about the most recent off the soundboard release from KISS, the 1984 Poughkeepsie New York show. Without further ado, let's get animalized and leap into this historical artifact. So, to start off, let's get into the background of this release. Why is it so important? Well, I'll read right from KISS's website here. KISS's fifth authorized soundboard live release is from the November 28, 1984 Animalized Tour show from the Mid-Hudson Civic Arena in Poughkeepsie, New York, featuring the only known soundboard recording with Mark St. John. Young and Wasted and Rock and Roll All Night are unfortunately incomplete recordings. But due to the historical importance of this show with Mark, we hope you all rock out to this as hard as we have. That's right, you heard that properly. A soundboard release of a show with Mark St. fucking John. One of only two and a half shows with Mark, and it gets it off the soundboard release. What are the odds of that? Not very high, I'll say that much. And considering that this is said to be the only soundboard recording that survived the tides of time that has Mark on it? Yeah, I don't think Kiss saying that this is a historically important recording is in any way an overstatement. After all, when it comes to any live footage of Mark, Kiss or otherwise, none of it was in high quality. Hell, there's still no video footage of Mark with Kiss. But the fact that this release has happened at all is a miracle to me. A dream come true. This is, arguably, the main soundboard release that I was wanting to happen even if I figured the chances were slim. This goes to show that my belief of nothing is impossible is a belief worth having. But with that bit out of the way, I feel it's necessary to cover more of the background of this release. Or rather, the era itself. The Animalize Era. Ah yes, a time of turmoil. We know the general gist. But there's a lot people don't talk about, which has led to an unfortunate amount of people having some odd opinions at the matter at hand. Look, let's just get into the actual dive of this whole fiasco. The year is 1984. KISS has been unmasked for about a year, and they've just finished their tour for their Lick It Up album. But despite how everything appeared to the public eye, there was, as usual, a lot of conflict behind the scenes. Gene and Paul weren't getting along with Vinny. Vinny had already been out of the band once, but got brought back to complete the American leg for the tour. But once that was done, he was gone again. And now, a new guitarist was needed. Enter Mark Norton. Yes, Mark Norton, not going by Mark St. John at this point. Why am I specifying this? Well, because of this. Mark, who called himself Mark St. John, everybody was Saint something or other in the 80s. Yeah, if what I'm thinking he's implying is what he's implying, that's not fucking true at all, Paul. You guys gave him that name, Paul. You guys made him change his name. Maybe Mark was the one who finally settled on Mark St. John. Maybe he brought that idea to the table. But he wasn't the one who brought the initial change about. I know, it may seem silly for me to be peeved about this, because to be fair, Paul is the same man who said Mark didn't play on stage with Kiss, and we all know that isn't true. But I'll discuss that more later, because I want to clear up a lot of stuff with this video. Now, where was I? Oh, right, Mark. Mark Norton, a guitar teacher from California, recommended by Grover Jackson, and chosen by Paul out of apparently around a hundred other guitarists. After that, he was rechristened as Mark St. John, plucked out of California and thrown into New York, and had to dye his hair black. Yeah, I know, odd specification, but he did. 
Now, with a full band, KISS was set to record their next album. Well, sort of. And by that, I mean Gene was kinda not there? Yeah, he was off doing movies. You know, Runaway? Yeah. So he didn't have the most involvement. And on top of that, he was also in a different studio than Paul. Which complicated things further. Oh boy. This resulted in Mark having to be tossed back and forth between the two during the recording of the album, along with many other conflicts. Mark didn't mesh personality-wise with Gene and Paul. After all, he was West Coast, and Gene and Paul were East Coast. Every other member had been from the East Coast like Gene and Paul. There were some considerable differences in attitude. Hell, at one point, supposedly, Mark found himself in the studio alone with the studio engineers, and recorded a bunch of stuff, only for Paul to hear it, and throw it out, because he didn't like it. And then after that, became more restrictive and limiting. Seriously, I'll read an interview excerpt from Mark, word for word. You mentioned at one of the expos that a lot of the time during the recording of the album, it was you and the engineers and techs, and that was about it. Well, I don't know why they even booked studio time when none of them were there. Gene was doing a movie in Canada, his runaway thing, so his mind is on other things and he doesn't even care about doing a record. He's going to be a movie star now. Paul, on the other hand, is in Bermuda with Lisa Hartman that week, and Eric is in Florida fucking some girls. So I'm in the studio recording, just me and a couple of engineers. We laid down a basic track, and I just kind of took the guitar and went one way and then the other way, and filled up both tracks of different guitars. So when they came back, they were horrified. It was like, that doesn't sound like us! And I was going, it isn't! It's me! Of course it doesn't sound like you, it's not you playing! They got all kind of weird about that and decided that they had to be there all the time while I was playing guitar, watching over me. It was one of those dog on a leash things. It got to the point where, this kind of pissed me off, it got like a game. It was like what I liked didn't matter to me anymore. As long as they were happy, I was happy to make them happy. You know what I'm saying? It was like I couldn't care less anymore. And when it comes to that, you really don't give a fuck about what you are doing. All you want to do is get the fuck out of there and go home, knowing that the next day you are going to have to do it again. What kind of band camaraderie is that? Give me a break. That really wore me out because Gene would be in one studio and Paul would be in another studio. They wouldn't record together, their egos are so big. So Gene would ask to Paul, can I use Mark now? So then Mark would have to get in a taxi cab, go all the way across town to the other studio and record with Gene. Then Paul would call Gene, can I use Mark now? So back and forth, I go like a guy delivering pizza. That wore me out because I'm getting up early in the morning, doing that, going home late at night, and then still having to rehearse my stuff to make it sound good for me. I could feel my world shredding, and I'm doing it all over and over again for two weeks straight. Yeah, talk about a real stressful experience. And mind you, Mark was locked into this with a five-year contract with no escape clause. Or so he thought. Kiss finishes recording the album and releases it. Animal Eyes. It does amazingly, getting high praise and the Kiss army enjoys it. Now they've gotta get ready for a tour, but Mark wants to visit his family and friends in California before that. After a lot of convincing, Gene and Paul let him go visit, and he parties with his friends and family. All is well. And then he wakes up the next day with swollen hands, knees, and ankles. Talk about a guitarist's worst nightmare. So, Mark goes to a bunch of different doctors, eventually finding a rheumatologist who told him that he had been stricken with arthritis. Again. 
guitarist's worst nightmare, especially a week before a big tour. After his diagnosis, he informed Gene and Paul, and the panic set in. Imagine getting a new guitarist, and only a few months in, he's already gotten some sort of issue. Worse yet, it's not something like a personality clash that you could get by with time. All Gene and Paul can do is pay for his health bills and hope he gets better in time. Mark does not get better in time for the tour. As such, Bruce Kulick enters the picture. Introduced to Gene and Paul by his older brother Bob Kulick, Bruce had worked with Kiss on Animalize a little bit doing solos on the songs Lonely as the Hunter and Murder in High Heels, something that I believe is a result of time constraints more than anything, as again, Mark couldn't be in two places at once. So, it only felt natural to take Bruce as a temporary replacement as Mark recovered, and off Kiss went on the European leg of the Animalized tour. Mark was not recovering very well. I mean, it's kind of expected. Come on, it was stress-related arthritis. You have the stress of worrying about recovering for your tour and working with people that just aren't compatible with you personality-wise. That's not exactly going to help you get better, especially when Paul claims to have called Mark every day asking if he was better. No, I'm not kidding. Listen to Paul say it. Mark couldn't move his fingers. My doctor says it will go away in two weeks, he told us. I called him every day. Any better? No. Yeah, perfect recipe for recovery. Right. Kiss gets through the European tour, and as time went on, Mark managed to slowly recover. While the North American leg would start with Bruce in the lead guitar slot, Mark would be backstage, hoping to get a shot to be on stage. And eventually, Mark would finally manage to play with Kiss. Great, right? If you're noticing a pattern of shit not going right, you'll know that it continues. Yes, Mark gets to play with Kiss. But here's the issue. For some reason, for some fucking reason, some bullshit fucking reason, Kiss just decided to not rehearse with Mark? At all? Sure, Mark got to see the rehearsals, he got to see the shows. But here's the thing, I do not care how much you see a live show, how much you see the rehearsals, you need that hands-on experience to understand what you are doing. To know what the choreography is, to know where you stand on the stage, and to figure out your dynamic with the band. And for a guitarist who, you know, plays an instrument with your hands, hands-on experience is important. And somehow, Gene and Paula just went, yeah, no, Mark doesn't need to rehearse with us, he can just jump on stage, no big deal. What the fuck? Gene! Paul! I know you two are smarter than that. I know that for a fucking fact. I think most of us know that for a fact. What were you two thinking? And I know, some people might say, well, he recorded a whole album with the band. He auditioned with them and played with them during that. He should figure out the dynamic pretty quickly. Uh, hello? That is nothing like playing on stage. And considering he was recovering from arthritis, odds are he wasn't able to play much guitar in his free time. Rehearsals would have helped immensely. So Mark is immediately thrown into the deep end. Even with doing half a show for his first night in Baltimore, Maryland, that's still a sudden move for someone who hasn't rehearsed once with the band he's playing with. That show started with Bruce and ended with Mark. And then you got five members of Kiss bowing on stage. Now that's a fun image to see. Then comes the fabled night that got the soundboard release. Poughkeepsie, New York. You know, Poughkeepsie has formed a pattern of having rock shows I have interest in. 
this show with Kiss and Mark St. John, and then Kane Roberts opening for Alice Cooper with his band Skywire. Fun fact, both shows took place in the same place, the Mid-Hudson Civic Center. Although the soundboard release of Mark's Poughkeepsie show calls it the Mid-Hudson Civic Arena. Not sure why that is, but okay. But the Kane Roberts Skywire thing is a story for another video. You know I needed the Kane Roberts reference somewhere, after all. Poughkeepsie is the first night Mark does a full show. Meaning, it's his first time he's getting to play half the setlist on stage. And this is something I feel people aren't keeping in mind while listening to this release? Like, I get most people don't know shit about Mark. I get it, you don't want to do a deep dive on him. Not everyone has that energy or dedication. Or they don't care enough to do that sort of thing. But come on, that should be considered surface level information. It should be spread around so people can understand what Mark was dealing with here. Then, after that night, Mark does his final show in Binghampton, New York. And Kiss decides they meshed brother with Bruce then Mark. When December 7th came around, Mark was finally let go, and Bruce was brought on board as a full Kiss member, and that's Kistery. So, with that Kistery lesson out of the way, now you understand everything behind this release. And now, we can talk about the performance itself. The setlist is as follows. Detroit Rock City, Cold Gin, Creatures of the Night, Fits Like a Glove, Heavens on Fire, A Guitar Solo from Paul, Under the Gun, War Machine, A Drum Solo from Eric Carr, Young and Wasted, A Bass Solo from Gene, I Love It Loud, I Still Love You, Love Gun, Black Diamond, Oh Susanna, Lick It Up, and Rock and Roll All Night. As many people know, and I'll mention this anyways, two songs in this release are incomplete recordings. It's not known as to why that is, perhaps tape ran out or they needed to flip the tapes or whatever. But the two songs in question are Young and Wasted and Rock and Roll All Night. We also got three singles from this release, which are hilarious when you catch a particular pattern. The three songs are Creatures of the Night, War Machine, and I Love It Loud. Ah, yes. You notice anything about those? Creatures of the Night. Okay, pretty standard song for the era. War Machine. Okay, a Gene song to balance with a Paul song. I Love It Loud. These are all from Creatures of the Night. I don't know if anyone else questioned this or thought about it, but when the third one released, it hit me, I just said, Oh, you fuckers! I believe this might be a result of the recent 40th anniversary Creatures of the Night box set release, so perhaps KISS decided to ride that wave, which is a fair decision on their part? I might do a video on that box set, because that era of KISS is also fascinating to me, and getting a deeper look into it is something that I enjoy. Granted, the history of musicians is interesting to me to begin with. Look at my channel. Come on. It's very obvious. But with all that laid out in front of us all, let's get into the performance itself. Detroit Rock City is the opener of the show. A classic, of course. And man, does this performance kick you into overdrive fast. The tempo is up, a standard for kissing the 80s, something that I am quite fond of. Unlike a lot of people for some reason. Listen, here's my defense against the opposing viewpoint. If Kiss isn't trying to tear my head off at the speed of sound, what's the point? Anyways, I really like the performance of the song here. Mark sounds great to me, and he doesn't stick out like a sore thumb sound-wise here. And I do like his solo in this song. It's a unique take on the Detroit Rock City solo, something that none of the other lead guitarists of KISS have really done, with a heavy emphasis on the strumming rather than holding a note. And then Paul decides to fucking shriek into your ears. How the fuck are you doing, Poughkeepsie? That gives us an amusing start to what I like to call Paul found out he likes to say fuck 
and is abusing it at every given opportunity. I blame Get All You Can Take on Animalize for this. Not in a bad way, but in a humorous way. I'm gonna start a fuck counter, actually. Fuck, fucking, fucking! One, two, three. I look forward to continuing to use this counter through this review. Trust me, he gets a workout. It almost put Kane Roberts to shame. Almost. You can't beat Kane, I say so. That aside, up next is Cold Gin. And Paul is screaming again. No, I'm not doing a screen count, you can do that yourself. Seriously though, when I listened to this for the first time, I was in hysterics because this is the funniest shit ever to me. What was up with Paul here? I know we got some people like to drink a little bit of alcohol, yeah! I know we got some people like to drink a little bit of tequila, yeah! I know we got some people here like to drink a little bit of Southern Comfort, yeah! It's really cool to hear the crowd here though, chanting cold gin in response to Paul's banter. And immediately, I love this song in a faster tempo. I know it kind of takes away that sleazy feeling the studio version has, but it adds a party feeling, which is perfect for what Kiss is clearly trying to convey on stage here. I can also really hear Eric Carr's backing vocals shining here, which is very welcome as you'd expect. I've always liked his backing vocals after all. Speaking of backing vocals, apparently Mark is doing some too. That's something that interests me, because he's the one KISS member that I've never heard take on lead vocals. But on the topic of Mark, his soul here is really nice. Different? Yes. But I like it. Different isn't bad. I know to many KISS fans that's a fucking crime to say, but I'm not here to rag on KISS for doing something different. Variety is the spice of life. And Mark transitions back into the main melody with ease, despite his lack of rehearsals. So he's handling this quite well for the hand he's been dealt. I know, I know, get out of your system. Hand. There. Anyways, I'm noticing Mark's guitar has a bit of a consistent feedback it is playing. For the most part, I think it adds an interesting flair. Though there are some parts in some songs that make me go, what is causing this feedback? Whatever it is, I don't think it was intentional. If anyone knows what the deal is there, let me know because I'm curious. Oh, also Paul Banter at the end. Fucking. And that's four fucks on the fuck counter. Additionally, Paul makes a reference to Animalize's title, and I am sad that I haven't seen more of the term Animalized be used in regards to Animalize. Creatures of the Night is up next, as Paul's banter on the previous track indicates, and this is the first single of the album as well. And the first time I heard this song, I was actually playing Splatoon 3. Yeah, I know, what an experience, playing an intense game with an intense new version of a song. Dark Chocolate vs. Milk Chocolate vs. White Chocolate Splatfest, I was Team Milk Chocolate and I want a match to this song, hearing Mark soloing with Kiss Live in high quality for the very first time. Hell, a live solo from Mark at all in high quality. My adrenaline was through the roof to say the least. So thank you, Paul, Jean, Mark, and Eric, for helping me win a match in Splatoon even if my team lost that Splatfest. Now, let's actually talk about the performance itself, huh? First off, if you listen real carefully, you can hear someone in the crowd yell Creatures of the Night right before Paul says it. Secondly, the bass is strong here. Keep that in mind for these following songs, by the way. Also, jeez, the feedback is really frequent in this song. To the point where I had to genuinely question if it was a guitar pick going up a string in the beginning of the song. Though I personally don't feel this detracts from my enjoyment of this performance. Once again, I love the faster tempo for this song in particular. It just adds to the song in general, I feel. As for Mark's solo, while it's not exactly what's on the original album, he does stay pretty close to it while giving it his own flair. 
But I do have one gripe with this track. Paul sounds like he's pushing himself a bit too hard at some points. Like, ow, your throat? Ow? Now, this isn't exclusive to this song, but really starts up here. And I'm not trying to give Paul shit here, because, if anything, this is a genuine concern for me. Because I had to have been sore later, right? At least he drank something in this song. I'm hoping it was water. Oh, and as for the fuck counter... Fucking fucking! Five and six. Jesus, Paul, are you trying to go for a world record or something? Because I'm all for it, actually. More fuckery, please. Fits Like a Glove is up next, and this song was one I was very excited for. But kind of found a lot of disappointment in? Not because the performance is, like, bad, because I do listen to it regularly and all, but I mean my expectations weren't exactly met. Most of my gripes with this are with Jean here, and I'll explain that as I discuss this performance. Instrumentally, this performance kicks ass. Eric's drums kick in hard, and it starts off solid with the ooh from Jean in the beginning. Now, I'm not expecting every high note from Jean here, as I know Kiss has always diverged from the album versions of songs when performing live, but I do wish there was more intensity in the backing vocals, which is there if Jean is singing along, but when Jean stops, the pre-courses seem really quiet in a sense, not as impactful, and that's sad because truth be told, those are my favorite parts of this song. Though I will say I can actually kind of pick up on Mark's vocals here, because while I know Paul's vocals and Eric's vocals, there's an unfamiliar voice and with process of elimination, it has to be Mark. And I really like that, because it gives me an insight on the sound dynamic vocally for this lineup. And it's a dynamic that I do enjoy. But now we get to the chorus, where Jean doesn't do that wail that's in the original. This is a consistent issue in this performance, and it's not that he doesn't do the wail right, it's that he doesn't do it at all. And even worse yet, he does not go full on with the, when I go through her, it's just like a hot knife through butter line. And it's not that he can't do it, because throughout this, he's doing his signature, oh yeah, thing, but doesn't do it after that part of the song, let alone finish the lyric. And this upsets me, because that aspect of the song, the fact that he goes absolutely fucking batshit in the studio version of this song, is why I love it in the first place. That doesn't mean I can't stand this performance, because all in all, I do love this song, but I can't help but mourn the loss of what solidified this song as one of my favorite Kiss songs of all time. And while this isn't unique to this performance, as the Animalized Uncensored performance has the same deal, I'd still like to talk about it here, as it does occur in this performance, and as such is very much necessary to note in my opinion. But my grief aside, I'll talk about Mark's solo in this, and it does this sort of ear-to-ear -ear thing to start off. It really does this solo justice! Does he do exactly what's on the album? No. But here's the thing. It's a Vinnie Vincent solo. A solo meant for shredding, and Mark was hired for that. Does he go wild with it? Yes, and I understand that not everyone likes that, but I'm someone who enjoys variety in the sound of other band members, especially in KISS. I'm also a sucker for shredding guitar, so I might be biased. Also, I know that this is also a deal with the Animalize Uncensored performance, but there's no pre-chorus after the solo. Which, I mean, I understand why, presuming they all go to the front of the stage like they did for that live video. But I can still be mildly upset about it. It's my right, it's my opinion, I like the pre-chorus, and to get less of it makes me sad. Also, with the backing vocals at the end, I definitely hear Eric more. So I feel that confirms I was hearing Mark earlier on. Oh, and more feedback does pop up at the end. But there is one thing I like, and that's the brief back and forth Mark and Jean have. With Mark doing a soloing bit, and then Jean doing a soloing bit. All in all, not a bad performance. And granted in hindsight, 
I probably should not have expected an experience similar to the album release of Fits Like a Glove, when I should have expected one more akin to Animalize Uncensored. But I didn't have Animalize Uncensored in my mind as any comparison to the Soundborn release. My bad. Heavens on Fire is up next, and I am reminded of the fact that the crowd has to yell instead of pant like Kiss does in the studio version. Which makes me laugh every damn time for some reason. I get why that's the way it has to go, but it's still funny to me. As for Paul's vocal intro, the classic warm-up intro, it definitely sounds a bit rough, but he still does it and it's great. What a classic intro, by the way. The bass is strong in this song, and once again I definitely hear Mark in the backing vocals, because, again, if Paul is to join in on the backing vocals, he never keeps it subtle and tends to stick out more in volume. As for the solo in the song, Mark nails it as I expected. After all, he did play that on the album. See? He can play the same thing twice. I'm going to point that out every fucking chance I get, so I can get it through people's heads, just so you know. I don't find myself having much commentary on this performance because it's pretty much perfect. I mean, there is feedback from Mark's guitar at the end, but that's been consistent throughout this whole concert, so I've kind of gotten used to it at this point. Oh, and no addition to the fuck counter. I'm mildly disappointed considering the theme of this song. Next up is a guitar solo from Paul, which, I mean, I guess it's just how Kiss was at the time? But I will be damned if I don't mention that I am disappointed at Mark not getting his own solo. I get it, I get it. It was Paul's solos during this era. He did that in the spotlight, I know. But come on, wouldn't you want to hear how a dedicated solo from Mark would sound? I do! And as you can see, I don't get that here. Well, at least there's footage of that with White Tiger, Mark's band after Kiss. That's something. But let's talk about Paul's solo. I really do like how his guitar sounds here. I don't know how to describe it. A twang? If someone can explain the sound, put a name to it, anything, please let me know. I need to know, because it's nice to my ears. I feel Paul's solos are kind of underappreciated. Granted, he is the rhythm guitar and not the lead guitar. I think equal opportunities should be given for both guitarists to shine. Oh, and I swear, he does a whole lot of love bit in this solo. Maybe I'm wrong, but I hear something at least reminiscent of it, and it's not out of the question considering Kiss did kind of throwing covers of songs into the setlist out of nowhere sometimes. And yes, that include whole lot of love. But that's not the point here. My point is that despite my disappointment in the lack of a Mark St. John solo, I still enjoy hearing Paul's guitarmanship here. And I know it's Paul because when we get into the next song, that guitar sound carries on into the intro and Mark's guitar sounds completely different from it. With that, now it's time to go under the gun. Okay, sorry, I saw the opportunity. But Mark kicks in with a kick-ass shredding solo, and this song's energy shows. I've always liked the amped up energy of this song, and this performance adds to it. Also, uh, hey, where did the bass go? Did something happen at some point in Paul's solo earlier? It feels like it got neutered. Oh, an immense disappointment in the lack of the 69 lyric. Shame on you, Paul. I mean this in the most lighthearted way possible. Um, as for Mark's solo, while he takes some artistic liberties with it, he for the most part nails it. In fact, he doesn't go too far off the album version, with most of the variety stemming from the fact that it's longer than the album version. And then Paul pulls a high note that sounds painful. Ouch. I know I can't expect the perfect vocal performance all the time, but I can still comment on it. This is an oddly consistent thing throughout this whole concert where he just seems to push himself too hard vocally. 
And it's weird because I've heard other performances from this era or the Lick It Up tour, and it's not normally like this. I wonder if this night was just particularly rough. Nah, I don't think I'm gonna get any answers on that anytime soon. Moving on from that, we go on to War Machine. And man, those drums! What an amazing intro! It feels like a perfect representation of marching into battle, with no intention of sparing anyone who crosses your path. But again, where's the bass? Hello? I noticed this when this was released as a single in comparison to the performance of Creatures of the Night. What the hell happened here? If any song needs that loud bass from earlier, arguably it's this one. It's a Gene song. Gene plays the bass. He should be adding to the power of the song with his bass. But he does knock it out of the park vocally, at least. Especially when he lets out a roar, a war cry, if you will, as he kicks into this song. The guitars sound amazing as well, so Paul and Mark are killing it. And I can hear Mark pop up during certain points, with what I'm guessing is whammy bar action, which I enjoy because it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb to me, but rather adds to the song and gives it some extra flavor. On the topic of Mark, I feel he did a good job with the solo here. Once again, this is a Vinny solo, and Mark definitely works well with the solos that were originally Vinny's. Oh, and the ending of this song, returning to that marching feel, is just a beautiful way to end it. What a performance! I wish the bass had been louder here, but otherwise, a solid performance. Up next is a drum solo from Eric Carr, and as you'd expect, this is just raw badassery at its finest. The gong going off and... wait... Did you hear that bass? Where the hell was that earlier? Where was that bass? You know what? We're not focusing on Eugene. It's Eric's turn. Go away. Anyways, you gotta love that rapid gunfire sounding bass drum from Eric. I've always loved his drum solos, with a giant drum set that he would have to stand on top of to be seen by the crowd. I have zero criticisms on his drum solo here, and I haven't had any criticism of his drumming throughout this concert. And for good reason. Eric Carr is a kick-ass drummer, and I am so glad that this solo is almost five and a half minutes long as a result, because the more, the merrier. And then comes the airplane noises. Jet engine? Whatever you want to refer to it as, it confused the fuck out of me when I heard it because I didn't see it coming. Oh, and you can hear Eric yell to the crowd. I love when you can hear musicians like that. They aren't near the mic to where they're clearly heard, but when you can just barely hear them, or when you're near them on the stage and you can hear them yell, that is the thrill of live concerts. All in all, this drum solo is everything you could want and more. Long live Eric Carr. After that killer solo, we have Young and Wasted. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I mean, the ballad of the young and the wasted. I do apologize, Sir Stanley. That aside, hey, hey, wait, the bass, what the fuck? What happened? Did he turn his bass down earlier or something? Did some sort of fuckery happen in the soundboard mixing that night? Because the loud bass is back. Where was this loud bass during War Machine? Under the gun? I want answers, man. And where's the guitars? Oh, the recording fades in the Mark solo. Well, I got one answer. Thanks, Mark. Yes, this happens because, again, this is an incomplete recording. And, once again, I'm not sure why this happened or how, but an incomplete performance is better than no performance, so I'll take what I can get. You've got to get all you can take, after all. Despite this, we still get some of Eric singing, and he sounds as good as ever. Once again, zero complaints on Eric's performance. 
However, I cannot say the same for a certain someone in the backing vocals. What is up with Jean's voice here? For the first time, I have to ask Jean why I've been internally asking Paul throughout this concert. Dude, are you okay? It's not that he's not hitting the right key or anything, it's just that it sounds like that had to have been a bit harsh on his throat. I know he's known for that growly sort of deal vocally, but this is damn near outright trilling. Otherwise, a solid performance from the band, especially from Eric. Young and Wasted was simply meant to be performed live by him. Now, if only this wasn't an incomplete performance. You win some, you lose some, I guess. Next up is a bass solo from Jean, which now brings me to a moment of realization. Everyone but Mark got a solo here. Yes, this makes me upset. No, you can't convince me that this was a reasonable choice. That's stupid. It's stupid that the lead guitarist did not get a solo. I do not care if this was a test run for Mark in terms of, oh, do we keep Bruce or keep Mark? That is incredibly stupid that the lead guitarist did not get a solo. Anyways, a solo from Jean. I love when musicians stop their music and listen for the crowd's cheers. And Jean does this quite a few times, which I heavily enjoy. The anticipation is what makes it great. Not only that, we also get to really enjoy Jean's bass skills. And then Eric Carr comes in, adding to this rhythm section onslaught. Gene and Eric just mesh together perfectly, and I love the groove that they bring here. Now, if it's an original piece or a cover of another song, I wouldn't be able to catch it as it's flown over my head. So if anyone could tell me the answer on that one, let me know. Thanks. Continuing on the spotlight on Gene, next up is I Love It Loud. The third and final single of this soundboard release and the one where I finally went, Oh, all of these are Creatures of the Night tracks. Okay. And oh my god. This fucking song. This fucking intro. I'm just gonna play it for you. Because it is seriously the funniest thing to me. Oh yeah! I don't know what was up with Gene and Paul this show, but clearly, they were on top of their comedy game. When I first heard this, I had to pause after hearing Gene go, Oh yeah! Because that alone is funny to me. Say what you will about Gene doing that voice, it cracks me up. Hell, anyone doing that voice cracks me up. There's a reason why I find the intro to Kane Roberts' song Outlaw on his 1987 debut album so funny. Because he does that voice, he does the YEAH! I should ask Kane if that was why he did it. But back to Kiss, and by that I mean Gene and Paul in particular. Because after Gene goes, OH YEAH! After I unpaused the song, once I regained my composure, all I hear is Paul go, eh. And I had to pause the song again to laugh. This will not be the only time Gene and Paul make me laugh during this performance. Yes, I know, we're late into the performance, but trust me, they pull another one from their sleeves. Now onto the song itself. Eric, of course, booms on his drums, and the classic chanting is as amazing as ever. And the bass doesn't overpower the song, but it's still noticeable. Again, where was this during War Machine? Okay, okay, I'll stop with the whining. It's time to talk about Mark's solo here. Now, this solo isn't a heavy shred solo, and Mark doesn't do anything extreme, staying pretty faithful to what's on the album, while still adding his own personal touch with a more rapid strumming to the notes, rather than just letting them go on their own, much like he did for Detroit Rock City. And again, 
I like it. It's something unique, something different, while still being spot on to the original song. I have zero complaints about this performance, and honestly, it's my current favorite I Love It Loud performance now. Oh, and then the song ends, and Paul goes, yeah, in that exact tone. I will play a clip. Listen. Yeah. See? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, Kiss. You never fail to bring a smile to my face. The tonal whiplash hits hard with the next song as we move on to I Still Love You. Yet another Creatures of the Night song. I should bring up the set list era coverage once I'm done reviewing these songs. I will. I promise. Anyways, Paul starts off the song and Gene hits a note on his bass that really makes the intro feel full, yet so somber. Perfect for this song. The emotions in Paul's voice are heart-wrenching. And hey, his higher notes sound much cleaner here. A lot less. Perhaps I spoke too soon. But I'll be real here. That kind of adds to this song. Think about it. The wailing, the crying out in despair, the heartache. And Mark doesn't go absolutely haywire with his guitar for this song, which is great, and it shows that Mark isn't what everyone claims he is. You know. Oh, all he does is shred. He shreds on everything. That sort of viewpoint? Yeah, no. This song alone shows that he's very much a capable guitarist. That is an oddly common snide remark that I hear towards any shredding guitarist, but when it comes to Kiss, it's mostly aimed at Mark. There's more painful howls from Paul, which seriously, it just adds so much to the song. And when we get to Mark's proper solo, he nails what's on the album. Sure, he adds some shredding towards the end of his solo, but it's not all over the place and feels tasteful. This performance stirs up such vivid imagery in my head, and it makes me want to drop to my knees, wailing as hard as Paul is. And then... Oh, boy. Jeez. Mark, what happened there? This is probably my first genuine ouch moment towards Mark here. That says a lot, considering that there's not much of this concert left to go, and I'm pretty sure it's Mark because it sounds like his guitar rather than Paul's. Ooh, and guess what's returning? Fucking fucking fuck counter! Seven, eight, come on, double digits! We can do this! Love Gun brings the whiplash full circle, just the way I like it. Though I've noticed that it feels like the stage banter here got cut off. It goes from I still love you, ending with Paul commenting on the heat of the stage and the crowd, to him talking about his <clears throat> love gun. There's definitely some missing material there, which upsets me because what if he said fuck? Then my fuck count would be inaccurate. But that's not the point of this video. Well, the primary point, anyway. This song was the one I was most excited for, hands down. Why? Well, there's a video that's been on YouTube for some time. It's a comparison of every Kiss lead guitarist doing a Love Gun solo. Mark's was a low-quality audio grab, but that alone made me yearn for a high-quality version of a Love Gun solo from Mark to even out the playing field between all five guitarists. Most people simply put him at the bottom purely for the audio quality. Or they just didn't care about Mark. Pick your poison. It's almost as bad as the people on there whining about Tommy there. But that's not the point here. The song kicks in with a higher tempo than usual, which as I've stated before, I enjoy the faster tempo Kiss took on in the 80s. And immediately, Paul's rough vocals are clear here. The delivery on the lyrics, Get Hot, are really shaky. 
I seriously wonder what was up with his voice that night. It is not just an era thing, and I know this. Was it lack of warm-ups? Lack of rest? Sickness? Hell if I know. The one thing that I do know is a part of this era is this. Unfortunately, Paul's vocals don't seem to improve, and that's a shame, but I don't think I should have expected him to miraculously get better mid-show. That's just not logical. But now, here comes the part I was waiting for. With the gunfire drums, Mark Solo comes in, and while it's very much different from what's on the album, I finally got my closure. My wish. I got to hear a Mark St. John Love Gun solo in crystal clear quality. At last. And I'm not gonna complain about his solo being different from what's on the album because, well, that'd be stupid to do. You cannot praise Vinny Vincent and Bruce Kulick for their Love Gun solos and then say, well, Mark's is bad because it's different. I've seen people do that. I wish I was kidding. Is Mark's solo objectively the best thing ever? No, because everyone has different tastes. But you cannot give that criticism to Mark, and then just give Bruce and Vinny a pass. In short, hearing this solo crossed off a major bucket list moment for me. Long live Mark St. John! Up next is Black Diamond, and Paul stops during the intro for the crowd's anticipation. Once again, love that! And then, as he's singing the intro, he stops again. Poughkeepsie, he says. I know you people know this song. Crowd participation time. And not just that, because Paul and Jean are up to shenanigans. Paul asks Jean if they should get the crowd drinks, and Jean agrees. And then... Paul says four cups are to be passed around for the crowd to share. Oh, Jesus Christ, this makes me wish there was video of this show, because I want to see this. I want to see if Eric and Mark were laughing at this too, because I know I would have been laughing if I was there. Then Paul gets back to encouraging the crowd to sing along with him. And then he wants to do another try, to do even better. And then a fucking bra is thrown on stage! And then Paul makes a remark of, oh, this isn't the biggest bra I've ever seen, which initially makes me go, Paul, why is that your response? And then he talks about wanting boobs in his mouth. Yeah, that's Paul. Peak Paul moment. Give the man his titties as a treat. And I'm, and I'm joking around. I need to finish this damn review and you four chuckle fucks are making that difficult. Paul gets back into the song, playing his guitar this time, and eagerly praising the crowd with a brief, yeah! Also, feedback is back, except it's not cool sounding, but rather harsh on my ears this time around. I know the feedback has been somewhat consistent and... Normally, it could pass as like, oh, it sounds cool, it sounds unpolished, which is great for the animalized rock and roll deal. This is not the case for this occurrence of this intro. But once the song kicks in, with an ever-fast tempo, Eric gets a chance to shine vocally again. At last. And, once again, I have no complaints for Eric here. And then the guitar harmony with Mark and Paul is just so good, and Mark's solo is just kick-ass. Though it gets kinda quiet towards the tail end of it, I can still enjoy his guitarmanship. And of course, the signature bridge solo of the song, where the song slows down, and I love the solo here with the jet engine mixed in. It makes it so atmospheric. Whoever decided this tour would have those sound effects needs a raise, because I love that cinematic vibe. It almost feels like a triumphant moment, and truth be told, maybe I'm biased because this performance being released was triumphant for me. And Paul speaks directly to the crowd, telling them the band loves them and adding another fuck to the fuck counter. Nine. Nine fucks. We can get one more in. We can. 
we gotta. One more fuck. One more fuck. Don't take this out of context or I'll bite you. And hey, Paul obliges! The band comes back and Paul goes on about rock bands generally sitting on stage for a minute. But it's simply too hot to do. Too fucking hot. And they want to fucking play for you people. Fucking fucking. Ten. Eleven. Eleven fucks on the fuck counter. Double digits have been hit at last. Let's go. Now, next up is Oh Susanna. What? Hello? Paul says, you're never gonna hear. Well, you may hear it again, but you'll have to probably watch Davy Crockett or something. And then I sit there, dumbfounded as I hear this fucking honky-tonk, yeehaw fucking shenanigan run go down. Losing my absolute shit, trying to process what is happening, sitting in my bed, rolling in hysteric laughter, trying to think about what prompted Kiss to do this song. And Paul then claims that every night, before he sleeps, he lies in bed and says that he is so glad that we all have tongues. Yeah, my confusion only furthered for this before I realized, oh fuck, Lick It Up is next, makes sense. But what kind of transition is that? Yeehaw! I sure am glad we all have tongues! And then he says there are plenty of girls who go to bed thinking, man, I am so glad those guys have tongues. Listen, I have been a KISS fan my whole life. I have witnessed all sorts of weird whiplash moments. Oh, Susanna has broken me. I would just end the video there if I could, but as you can tell by the set list, no, I cannot. On that note, right, so as you guess by Paul's sudden fixations on tongues, Lick It Up is next, and it's dedicated to everyone who knows what to lick. Yeah, the fixation on tongues continues, but you know what, that doesn't matter anymore, because this performance kicks so much ass. The fast tempo, the drums, the guitars, the bass, and Paul's vocals are sound good. And wait, did I hear that right? So fucking smooth? Is that in addition to the fuck counter? Twelve fucks. That sells it. I forgive Kiss for breaking me with Oh Susanna earlier. I'm a simple woman, what can I say? This is arguably my favorite song in this performance. The energy alone gets me every time. And Mark Solo, even with the feedback, just sounds so good. If anything, the feedback's timing makes for a cool solo to me. Go, Mark, go! I don't have any complaints about this performance. They kicked ass here! Good job, guys! This is officially my favorite performance of Lick It Up! Last, but not least, is Rock and Roll All Night. And of course, Paul wants audience participation. And he wants us to get fucking crazy. Quoted from Paul directly. Listen. We gonna want you to get fucked. Crazy, man. That makes 13 fucks on the fuck counter. Hey, can I get one more? Let me have my lucky number. This is the last fucking song. <gasps> yes! Thank you, Paul. Lucky number 14. That's my number. 14 fucks on the fuck counter. Let's get into this song with Eric's drums kicking in, the crowd cheering, and then Paul encourages everyone to clap their hands. And then the band comes in. The grand finale. Gene kills it with his vocals here, and Paul makes a point to cheer on the crowd. And he also makes sure to remind us to clap our hands. And then Mark gets to do his solo, and I was so afraid that a cut would happen before or midway, but I get to enjoy every bit of his solo, shredding and all. And Paul encourages the crowd to cheer with him before giving everyone a moment to catch their breath. And then he quietly sings. And for some reason, that makes me laugh, especially with Gene specifically being loud in contrast. And I get one last laugh with that. <laughs> 
because that's where the song fades out, the incomplete portion happening. That leaves the fuck counter at 14, and the concert is over. So, with all of that together, let's discuss the setlist itself and my overall opinion on the show itself. Firstly, the setlist is, unsurprisingly, mostly 80s Kiss songs, which were the most recent releases. Creatures of the Night, Lick It Up, and Animal Eyes. In fact, there's two songs from Animal Eyes, which are Under the Gun and Heaven's on Fire. Four are from Creatures of the Night, with Creatures of the Night, War Machine, I Love It Loud, and I Still Love You. And then Lick It Up has Lick It Up, Young and Wasted, and Fits Like a Glove. I'm a bit surprised to see a considerable lack of Animalize tracks, but seeing as this was later in the Animalize tour and comparing set lists, they just kind of dropped a lot of Animalize tracks as they went on. And that's a shame, because I would have loved to have heard Mark do Thrills of the Night or I've Had Enough Into the Fire live. But the fact that I get to hear him play live with Kiss It All in this sort of high quality is good enough for me. As for the performance itself, I found that most of my gripes were with Paul and Jean rather than Mark, let alone Eric. I don't think anyone has issues with Eric's performance anyways. But Paul's vocals are definitely not in top shape here, and I don't mean this as some sort of insult, I mean this as in it's just kind of an objective fact with how some of his notes sound, and how some of his deliveries sound vocally. I'd love to figure out why this is, but I think it's just a rough night for him for this particular show. I mean, we know how he can be, pushing his voice hard. It's bound to take a toll. Gene's situation is less on him, however, as I don't think Gene intentionally turned his bass down. But the bass vanishing after Paul's solo really makes me sad, because songs like War Machine would benefit from the strong bass that is in songs like Creatures of the Night and hearing those two singles without that context was very fucking confusing, because I had to wonder when the bass had vanished until the full release. Whatever happened here, though, is probably out of Gene's control. As for Mark, I feel it's necessary to give him props for how well he did despite the situation he was in. Recovering from arthritis, likely unable to practice playing his guitar nearly as much before the tour, the fact that for some reason he didn't get to rehearse on stage with the band properly despite being there and being available to do so? And considering Mark's comments of it being hard for him to tell if he was playing right because of factors such as the sizes of the places they played at, or the volume and whatever else played into it? The fact that Mark managed to nail these solos is a goddamn miracle! I get not being into the shredding style of guitar, because I think with KISS fans it's more common just because of the fact that KISS's origins do not have that sort of style in there at all. But you need to give Mark credit where it is due. He did his best, and his best was pretty damn good if you ask me. Additionally, because I mentioned this earlier, I hope to god that this can finally fucking put what Paul said about Mark and his book to rest. Seriously? First off, this absolutely debunks his claim that Mark never played on stage. We can all agree on that. But I can't play the same thing twice. Okay, sure. Under the Gun and Heavens on Fire proved that wrong beyond a shadow of a doubt for me. As if the fact that Mark was a guitar teacher before he was in KISS didn't disprove that as it was. If you still quote any of that, after this video in regards to Mark, shame on you people. Shame on you. And of course, on a more positive note, Eric Carr knocked it out of the park. Seriously, zero complaints in regards to him. I just wish Young and Wasted wasn't an incomplete performance, because I think more of Eric is better here. Now, here's one last question I want to discuss. Was Mark a good fit for Kiss? I say it's kinda hard to tell. I mean, let's be real. The tour had gone on for a while by this point. Mark was thrown into the deep end with almost no preparation. He was thrown into a very much established and nailed down show. 
plus all the other factors at hand. And on top of all of that, this was his first time doing a full show with Kiss. The show before this was a half show for him, with him coming up on stage halfway through it. This was his first time playing some of these songs live in front of a crowd. Why is anyone considering this to be a good example of something to decide if he would have been a good fit for Kiss in a live setting? Is it because they lack the knowledge of everything behind the scenes? Is it simply them not liking his playing style personally, something that is subjective? I'm not sure. But here's my answer to the question as to if Mark fit in with Kiss. I think he could've. I mean, he would've had to, considering the five-year contract. If he had not been stricken with arthritis, or if he had been chosen over Bruce in the end, he would've eventually gotten his footing. Kiss's dynamic with Mark would've, in due time, been figured out. Would Mark have stayed after those five years? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on if he would have eventually gotten along with someone like Paul who seemed to butt heads with him a lot. And even Gene had his moments with Mark and not getting along with him. I think eventually Mark would have left and Bruce was an inevitable choice for the band regardless of how it went down. It simply feels like Bruce was destined to be in Kiss in the end to me. Though now that five year contract is making me wonder how the other albums would have sounded with Mark. I imagine Bruce wouldn't be out of the picture entirely, though. He would have at least written with Kiss regardless, if you ask me. Asylum. Crazy Nights. Hot in the Shade. How different would those sound? And then what about albums after that, provided Mark were to stay? I would kill for Mark to play on Take It Off. Yes, that's just because I'd want to know Kane Roberts' opinion on Mark St. John's guitarmanship. I like hearing my favorite musicians talk about each other. When it's not drama. When it's not drama. Though Mark staying in Kiss would probably mean no White Tiger. And I don't think Kiss would have had songs like Northern Wind or Stand and Deliver on their albums. Which, by the way, if you haven't already checked it out, I did make a video talking about White Tiger. Go give it a watch if you want to see what Mark did after his tenure in KISS. Now, with all that said and done, here's my final opinion on this performance. I think this performance was pretty good. Does it have its flaws? Sure. But do you really expect any performance to be perfect? If you do, why? Why? The musicians are people. They're human. No person on this planet will have every single one of their shows be perfect in every single way. That's the way it goes. That's what being human is about. So even with the flaws, my criticisms, I love this performance. I loved this look into such a rare KISS lineup, finally getting to hear this lineup in such pristine audio quality. This soundboard release was, arguably, the one I wanted the most. Every time a new soundboard would come out, I would jokingly complain, when are they gonna give us one with Mark St. John? And I got it. So, I'm happy. I can finally sleep at night, knowing that I have more of Mark St. John's guitar in my playlists at last. As a final note on all this, I'd like to dedicate this video to both Mark St. John and Eric Carr. It's only fair to do so, especially with this being the first soundboard we get to hear Eric on, and potentially the only soundboard with Mark on it at all. Unless Kiss by Some Miracle finds another, in which case I'll eagerly cover it here. May Mark and Eric live on forever through their musicianship. And when you crank up this album, just know that odds are, they'll be smiling upon you as you do so. I think I've got it all covered now. Without further ado, this has been Nash Bandit, as Kane Roberts would say, rock the fuck on.